Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Aika Zikibayeva. I'm a product marketing manager here at Cockroach Labs, and I'm happy to be joined by my colleagues Lakshmi and Andy, um, who will be in conversation with us today about what's new in CockroachDB. As a reminder, we will have a uh, swag giveaway today. The first 30 attendees of today's webinar dialing in from North America, the EU and the UK will be the lucky owners of this very exclusive summer 2023 edition of our bucket hat. So uh, nice. hopefully we'll get up there and I see we're already above those 30 attendees. So awesome. I'm glad to see that we're gonna be giving away all of the summer bucket hats. Um, and the question is, do we count or yeah. no? I, I was definitely okay. the first. Could I, yeah, right. <laughs> I'll make sure I'll uh, I'll get you guys some in the mail. So um, I would love to uh, have Lakshmi and Andy. You introduce yourselves. So Lakshmi, let's start with you. Yeah, definitely. Hi everyone. So my name is Lakshmi, and I'm the director of our cloud platform uh, product area. So this is the platform that supports our SaaS offerings, uh, dedicated and serverless, which I'm sure we'll talk about. Great, Andy. Hi everybody, I'm also a director of product management. My area is uh, data interfaces. So uh, these are things like uh, SQL, uh, migration tooling, which we'll talk a lot about today. Uh, a lot of observability touch points, um, you know, ways that people get their hands on the, on the database. Exciting, thank you so much. And I'm so happy you guys are joining us today. Um, so the conversation is really gonna be around what is new today. Uh, we, we did a release about a couple of weeks ago with announcement on our website, with PR, blog posts, et cetera. But this is really an opportunity for us to really talk about why we built what we built today. Um, and it really starts with our customers. We listen very intensively to what our customers and prospects are saying. and a lot of you are on your cloud journey today and you want that benefits of the cloud. That's that being elastic scale, consumption-based costs, operational ease of managed services. So we heard you say that, and we're really bringing you CockroachDB as a phenomenal bridge to that cloud so that you don't feel the drawbacks of being locked in in a cloud vendors, uh, proprietary services, or their platforms. So a lot of the flexibility around your infrastructure, the automation efficiency um, that we already have built into CockroachDB is getting enhanced. Uh, we're also now deployed on a new um, cloud service, Azure, uh, and, uh, and really migration and the adoption of CockroachDB is becoming super seamless. Um, and the distributed SQL functionalities of our database are uh, becoming more and more advanced. So that is what we're going to be talk talking about. Um, feel free to drop any questions you may have for myself, Lakshmi, or Andy in the Q&A section of Zoom. Uh, we will address um, most of them at the end. However, if there are some really exciting questions that really fit in well into what we're discussing throughout the webinar, we'll make sure to uh, nicely interject and ask those questions during the webinar as well. So without further ado, Lakshmi, let's start with you and uh, CockroachDB as a service on Azure. Uh, what is it? Uh, why is it now? Why is the right time now to really expand our database as a service um, on Azure Cloud? Yeah, definitely. Uh, this is one of the most exciting releases uh, that we've had on our cloud platform for, I would say, the last couple of years. So, Ika, like you said, you know, we work very closely with our customers to solve their business problems. So, when we started building our cloud offering, you know, four or five years ago, at the time, most of our customers were in AWS and GCP. So, that's where we started with our support. But you know, in the last couple of years, Azure has really grown in maturity, popularity. It is, of course, the second biggest cloud now, um, right next to AWS. So you know, it's only natural that our customers are also asking for that support. So it's really just meeting our customers where they're at. Um, another kind of interesting reason of why now, it's along those lines, we're also finding that for customers who are already on AWS and GCP, you know, one of the other clouds, um, they're doing increasingly business in more than one cloud. So. This might be because of compliance reasons, regulatory reasons, or just kind of de-risking. You kind of alluded to that, um, being on, you know, all in on kind of one single cloud provider. Um, I'll use a, a real example here. One of our largest customers today, you know, a financial services company, um, they have a London presence and they have a New York presence. And the Bank of England has a mandate that they need to spread their risk across multiple clouds and multiple environments. So for them, that means running on one of the existing clouds, GCP, as well as Azure. So, Really, again, it comes down to kind of solving the customer problems. And for customers, this means, you know, de-risking uh, their application, either for resilience reasons, regulatory reasons. And yeah, Azure is just a, a very, very key part of that story. So very, very excited to announce 
limited access support to care. Yeah, that, that's super exciting, Lakshmi. And I, I think it's it's cool as well because, um, you know, this is about adding it to our cloud, but we have a deep history with Azure, right? Like we've been writing about it in the cloud report for multiple years. We have many self-hosted customers who have been using Azure on their own. And so um, it's really nice to have some, some parity between those offerings too, right? Then you can choose the right product for yourself, but, you know, we're not new to Azure. We're not new to the experience here. We know exactly how to, to help you get the best performance, best experience, you know, with our product, with that space. So it's really exciting to, to be able to talk about all, all the thoughts here, I think. Yep, absolutely. Interestingly, we actually do have a question and I think we can plug it uh, into Lakshmi, what you can say. So it's um, the question is from yeah. Nicholas. He's asking about, um, well, first of all, he's been waiting for the Azure offering. So glad Nicholas that we can kind of meet you uh, where you need to be. Um, and he's asking about the difference between what we have built today on Azure versus our serverless offering. So maybe this is a chance to talk about what does managed service on Azure really mean? Um, and maybe yeah. talk about what we had before with self-hosted. Yeah, definitely. So just as a, a bit of a primer, maybe for who, folks who are not existing customers on the cloud platform. So our cloud platform has kind of two offerings. Um, there's dedicated uh, and then there's serverless. So dedicated, you should think of it as kind of provisioned uh, machines, you know, there's a high degree of kind of customization, advanced security capabilities, you can pick your own kind of size of compute, storage, scale them separately, so on, just kind of more control. Um, and serverless, if you're kind of familiar with our serverless offering, this is really a auto scaling uh, usage based pricing offering. So instead of upfront choosing what size of database cluster do I want, um, you simply just get started and then we will you know, scale based on your load. Um, and you also only pay for what you use. So if you're not, you know, you don't see much traffic in your app, the, the, the offering kind of the database cluster scales down to zero um, and that's great. So they're kind of slightly different flavors. Uh, they both run Cockroach DB, full support for SQL and kind of all the, the beautiful things about Cockroach like multi-region support, which I'm sure we'll talk about. So to kind of directly address your question, today we have uh, both dedicated and serverless support um, available in AWS and GCP, the, the two kind of cloud offerings. And we just came out with Azure support on dedicated. So the kind of first offering I was talking about in limited access. Um, Azure isn't yet available uh, on serverless, but it's definitely coming. Uh, we're taking, you know, our, our approach to kind of product development is to break into chunks so that we're iteratively delivering customer value and kind of working with customers. So fear not, Azure support is definitely coming for serverless, but kind of our first um, release is really uh, focused on dedicated because that's kind of where a lot of our customer demand has been for Azure. I don't know if that answers your question, Nicholas, but hopefully it does, yeah. So you mentioned limited access, Lakshmi. Can you talk a little bit more and contextualize what it means for prospects and customers um, evaluating us um, on Azure? Yeah, definitely. So like I was mentioning, you know, a big part of what we do in product is de-risking how we ship something, right? You don't want to build something for 12 months, ship it, turns out it, it doesn't actually meet customer demands. So limited access is really our first step of saying like, here is a set of core functionality that is sufficient for you to kind of get started on Azure. Um, so it may not have every single kind of feature and capability you're familiar with on AWS and GCP, but it does have a core set of functionality that should be uh, more than sufficient for you to you know, get started. So this has been vetted by you know, current customers, right? That's kind of how we arrive at it. Um, limited access also means that we work very closely with you. So it's not uh, publicly available to every customer. So you'd have to kind of contact us. We can send a link actually, um, let's do that icon. Maybe I'll post the link after I, I speak around how to sign up, we'll make the, uh, the functionality available um, in your org and we will work very closely with you uh, to make sure you have the right experience. So, yep, that's that's limited access. It's kind of our first uh, big release uh, in a long uh, journey of, you know, incrementally adding customer value. Actually, what, what kind of customer workloads, what kind of customers um, are we looking for for this limited access? You know, who, who are good candidates for us to, to partner with before we expand it out to everyone else? Yeah, definitely. Um, but for limited access, we really prefer uh, folks who are kind of starting off either kind of a development or testing kind of application. Um, that's just our preference because, like I said, it's a limited set of functionality. Um, so if you have any kind of existing workloads or new workloads that you're getting started, that's perfect. There's no particular use case. I think any use case that would be a good fit for Cockroach TV would also be good fit for you know, um, Azure support. So there's no limits around that. Um, and then depending on kind of your you know, requirements around maybe security or some of the advanced functionality, you know, we can have that conversation of like what's available, uh, but that's part of the design partnership is, you know, you, you really want, I'm not making up a feature, let's say customer match encryption key, let us know and we'll make sure that is part of the kind of next iteration of it. So 
uh, yeah, I guess the short answer is not a whole lot of uh, uh, you know, constraints around who can sign up as long as uh, you're willing to work with us closely. Thank you, Lakshmi. So serverless on Azure coming in the future, but what is available now is multi-region. So let's shift gears yes. a little bit and talk a little bit more about what is exciting about multi-region serverless. Yeah, definitely. This is another, again, uh, massively exciting part of our release. So I mentioned our cloud platform has kind of two flavors, right? Serverless and dedicated. So serverless is, again, is our auto-scaling, usage-based um, kind of offering uh, that doesn't ask you the upfront kind of provision or size the cluster. And one of the key reasons customers choose CockroachDB is for multi-region. And actually, Andy can speak about multi-region for hours because he uh, is, is our subject matter expert on multi-region as a core functionality. Um, so Andy, please correct me or, or add uh, as I speak. And you know, customers use multi-region for all kinds of uh, different problems that they're trying to solve. So for certain customers, especially for those of you who are based in the EU, um, it's about regulatory compliance where you, know, you need to store your EU user data in the EU. Mm -hmm. There are customers for him. It's about performance. You know, you have users in Australia, your app is running on the East Coast. You don't want to wait for that like round trip uh, because that's just bad uh, user experience for those, those customers in Australia. Um, for others, it's about resilience, right? They want to survive a regional outage. Um, I don't know if you remember this. I, I think we talked about this a couple of weeks ago. There was this GCP outage in Paris due yep. to, was it a flooding of a data center? It was a right? flooding. Yes. Uh, flooding. So, I mean, that, I think that data center was unavailable for weeks and there were 100 plus GCP offerings that had you know, either complete unavailability or just problems for weeks. These things happen. So who is at of... the top of the list of why they're, they're <laughs> yeah. <thinking> that, right? <laughs> I mean, that's pretty wild. Yeah, uh, it's really unfortunate. I mean, you can talk about you know how often do these things happen? Are they black swan events? But the thing is, that you should prepare for that as a business. Mm -hmm. So again, a multi-region setup you know, helps you against that. So I'm listing out all these things because there are lots of different problems that multi-region solves, depending on what your um, your customer and your business problems are. Now, one of the downsides of multi-region is that it's expensive. You know, you have to have nine VMs across three regions, and for a lot of customers, that's just a large upfront investment before they have users in all these regions. So that's where multi-region serverless comes in. It allows you to use this multi-region capability um, from day one when you build out uh, by only paying for what you use because it's really kind of a fraction of the cost because of the, the auto scaling and usage-based pricing uh, feature. But yeah, otherwise it's all of the beautiful things about multi-region just available in serverless uh, at a fraction of the cost. I don't know, Andy, if you want to add anything since you're you have a slightly different perspective on multi-region, I think. <laughs> yeah, no, I think that's that's extremely well said. You know, I, I think Cockroach offers multi-region capabilities that are are hard to get, if not outright impossible to get in other database offerings, right? And so um, we have in, we have uh, a long history of supporting customers accomplish their goals here in this process. And um, what's exciting is, is to be able to pair this with serverless, right? You know, this, this user-based yeah. product is, is so powerful, right? Because it's, it's not just about like um, the fact that there's like parity between the products now, but it's about the fact that um, it enables new use cases to be this way, right? Imagine you have a new workload and you're excited about this workload being in multiple domains, but you haven't proven it out to the market yet, right? Well, previously you'd be forced to either over provision and pay a bunch of money and hope that your business catches up to the investment or um, not expand nearly as rapidly, right? Because you, you have to be conservative with your, with your resources, right? So this gives you a real option to, to do more here. Yeah, from day one. I, I like the kind of making multi-region available for everybody, whether it's dev testing or somebody just doesn't want to pay up front. Um, I, my, small plug here, we have six regions in AWS and GCP. Sorry, we're getting into the tactics now. Um, it is in public preview, which means unlike Azure, you can sign up today, you can create a cloud org. It's already available. So certainly kind of test it out. And let yeah. us know. We'd love, it. We'd love to get people's hands on it and, and let us know. You know, I think... Uh, Lakshmi was talking earlier about design partnerships, right? And, and, you know, working closely with our customers and understanding what's working, what could be improved, these kind of things, you know, there's there's no substitution for for um, detailed information. And so we, we definitely want folks to get their hands on it and, you know, give us feedback and let us know uh, what's, what's going on, so. Yeah, I love that you mentioned the use cases too, because depending on, no matter what, how big or small your organization is, this is really a great way to test out those workloads um, and really understand how CockroachDB is different. So having the multi-region capability is just another great uh, way to, yeah, build that really uh, global application. Um, Nicholas also asked, how can I get my hands on regional serverless? So Nicholas, on our website, uh, we do have a serverless uh, 
landing page where you can basically sign up, uh, create a cluster for free. Um, Lakshmi or Andy, do you want to speak about kind of the high level work, work through of how to get started? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's honestly as simple as uh, if you already have an, a cloud org, you go in and when you in the kind of create cluster flow, you'll see serverless and you click on serverless and you can create multi-region from the beginning. It, it takes less than five seconds to create a multi-region serverless cluster, which is honestly kind of incredible if you think about it. You get a database cluster that spans. And also the other plug I'll say is that um, depending on your usage, you might even be within the free tier. So you might actually not even be paying for it. This is truly no other kind of database can give you the sort of capability, right, in serverless. Um, so I don't know if Nicholas, hopefully that answers your question. Um, sign up for the cloud org, get started today. Amazing. Thank you. All right, we're going to switch gears just a tiny bit. Um, so cloud deployment, we've kind of evaluated what we can do today. Um, we also have a lot of customers coming off of some legacy technologies and they really want to get their mission critical workloads off of those and onto CockroachDB. So thankfully we have migration services already built in. This is something we first announced last year. Um, it's known as Molt. So Andy, can you talk to us a little bit more about what is Molt and uh, what are some of the exciting new things that came out in our migration services? Yeah, absolutely. So MOLT is our somewhat clever uh, acronym here. It stands for Migrate Off Legacy Technology, right? So it's a suite of functionality. Wow. I did not know that actually today I learned. <laughs> I thought it was a cockroach analogy, maybe. I mean, it like is, right? Like you're setting it's both. your okay. skin, you're like, you know, so it's mm -hmm. like it's the, the cutesiness between the two, right? So, um, but yeah, so uh, the way I like to think about it is that, you know, um, uh, it's like moving, right? Like you have picked out a new place that you want to move, but has great things like multi-region or high availability or a fully managed offering, right? It's got, you know, this amazing, you know, kitchen and dining room and everything else, right? But you're worried about the actual cost of the move, right? Like who's going to put the items in a box and put it on a truck and take it over and unpack it, right? And, and it starts to be like, well, maybe I don't really want this, you know, nice, great, amazing new apartment or house. Um, and, and that's where I think our migration tooling and our migration story comes into place here, right? Is that we're about giving you a set of tools, giving you a set of capabilities to take the pain out of the migration, right? So help you move to Cockroach for all those things that we're, we're really great at, the elastic scale, the data placement, the high availability, right? The, uh, the all those types of things, right? So um, within Molt, we have a couple of different tools. So uh, last year we announced support for AWS DMS, which is a um, data migration service. Um, we also announced a schema conversion tool. Uh, this is about taking a, a Postgres or Oracle or MySQL or SQL server, uh, a schema and converting it into cockroach acceptable format, right? And so it does some clever things here about, um, you know, not just making sure that the dialect will work in cockroach, but also that it'll have good performance recommendations, give you a, a good schema design for the distributed SQL system, right? And so um, we have continued to build on these capabilities um, and I'm really excited to, to talk about them today. So uh, now instead of just AWS DMS and the data migration, we also have a partnership with Click and with Stream who are are two leading data migration tools. Um, and so this is about letting you choose the right tool for, for your job. Maybe your company has familiarity with one of these tools already and you, and you like it and want to use it. Right? We want to let you use the tools you want to do to, to make the migration over here uh, to Cockroach. And then the schema conversion tool has actually been expanding quite a bit because one of the things that, that we found is that um, people want to move many workloads over and they want to move big workloads that have multiple tables and multiple columns in multiple tables, right? And so I'm um, having to make changes uh, for all of those things um, could be a little bit time consuming, right? And so we've introduced bulk changes into the schema conversion tool where, you know, you can make changes across the entire set of, of schema here as you're as you're moving it over to Cockroach. And the, the last big thing I'll, I'll tease here that I'm sure we'll, we'll talk about in more detail is um, you could actually hook your uh, Postgres and MySQL clusters up to the schema conversion tool directly, right? So before you had to bring a file over, you had to bring a dump of your schema over and then go through this process. But now you can actually authenticate with those clusters and have the schema conversion tool pull it for you automatically, right? So just removing that friction, that burden of being able to, to come all the way over here to, uh, to Cockroach. That's really neat. I'm actually curious, Andy, what are the most common uh, databases that you see users migrating off of to to Cockroach and maybe specifically using Molt within with that, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. So um, Cockroach is built as a Postgres compatible database um, from the beginning. So that's that's always been part of our focus is um, 
you know, implementing the, the SQL standard, but in the flavor of Postgres, right? So mm -hmm. uh, we do see quite a lot of folks moving from Postgres. That's probably our, our most common uh, move over, um, particularly because Postgres is a fantastic database. Like it's, it's a really great offering, um, but Postgres starts to have problems at scale, right? And it starts to have problems when you need to shard things and deal with it across this, or you need to deal with um, high availability concerns and fault tolerance and stuff like that. So especially as we get to, to sort of bigger workloads or workloads that just can't can't simply go down, uh, we, we see a lot of people moving from, from Postgres. After that, it's MySQL. MySQL is, again, mm -hmm. another, you know, I think a, a common thing that you'll hear is that a lot of these legacy databases are, are actually fantastic databases, right? They've, they've stood the test of time and they've been great mm -hmm. offerings. And that, um, you know, they were just designed for a different time period, right? They weren't designed to be cloud native. They weren't designed to, you know, elastically scale out, right? And so um, I think folks want the same assurity and confidence and experience that they have, but, you know, take advantage of the new capabilities here, right? And so we're, we're committed to meeting them, you know, where they're at there. And so after that's Oracle, then SQL Server, those are kind of the, the big four that we see, although we, we do have yeah. folks that uh, realized that they fell into the uh, NoSQL area and maybe that wasn't appropriate for their particular workload and they want to come over as well. Um, yeah. yeah, those are the those are the big four. Interesting. Yeah. Andy, I'd love for you to share maybe a real life example of a successful migration story that you witnessed here. Yeah, yeah, it's a it's a great question. So I, I think like we, you know, it's funny because um, with some customers, they want to bring a brand new workload to us. And in some ways, that's like the easier place to get started, you know, because there's a, a little bit more flexibility, right? And then what quickly happens is that customers start to bring one workload and they're like, oh, Cockroach is pretty cool. I, I like the experience I have here. I, I wish I had the same experience for these other workloads, right? And so they start to expand and go down the, the path there of, of bringing in other workloads to the, to the product. And I think um, one of the things that, that is cool in my experience is that um, a couple of years ago, we we were sort of only seeing the new workloads or mostly seeing the new workloads. And now we actually see a larger percentage of customers are bringing their migrations over their existing workloads over. And the reason is that they they have this, you know, mission critical workload that they're ready to move right on over. So mm -hmm. uh, we've been working with several logistics companies uh, recently that um, are really keyed into this type of scale. You can imagine that, um, you know, with all of the packages floating around that people are getting and, and coming. In fact, I think my doorbell rang a few minutes ago for a package. I, there's lots of data around this, lots of state that people are trying to keep track of. You know, sh shippers want to know what's happening. Delivery drivers want to know what's, you know, all these types of things, right? And so this is a, a perfect type of data to come over to Cockroach, right? And so we're, we're seeing a lot of customers, um, you know, bring those migrations over accordingly. That's yeah, great. the sort of logistics uh, vertical, I'm sorry, like I was just going to say, that's been a, a really interesting set of use cases vertical that's really uh, expanded in the last year. You know, it used to be kind of system mm -hmm. of record, retail, e-commerce, even gaming, those were kind of our classic financial services, e-commerce, but this logistics stuff has been really interesting. Quite a few customers both on cloud and self hosted for that. Absolutely. Definitely. And yeah. we're seeing commonalities too with use cases across yeah. verticals, right? Like FinServe, yeah. logistics. Um, some of the streaming and media companies as well, um, needing to really think about data regulations and placement and um, global expansion. So um, it's it's great to be uh, seeing how they are all using CockroachDB in different but also similar ways. Um, so speaking about uh, building on CockroachDB, um, Andy. So we've migrated now. So we're in here. What are some of those uh, maybe familiar but also new and kind of enhanced features that our users can expect to see uh, with this new release? Yeah, that, that's a that's a, a great question, I guess. So um, two big areas of expansion in the SQL area are user-defined functions and um, uh, uh, search, right? So uh, full text search. Um, user-defined functions were something we actually introduced in a preview fashion in the previous release, but we built on those. And um, we're actually, um, one of the ways that we built upon them is we actually made them distributed, right? So we made them be a part of our distributed SQL platform here. And so uh, for folks that are, are less familiar with this, part of the way Cockroach is differentiated is um, both in how our optimizer works and also how our execution engine works. So it actually uh, can plan and execute uh, queries using different parts of the engine, using different nodes, different resources in the system, right? And so um, UDFs now can do that, right? So you, you have all of the sort of reasons that you might have wanted to use a UDF or, or previously, you know, to uh, allocate a certain chunk of code, a certain set of functions, put that logic in the database or near the database now, but um, we can actually execute them in a distributed fashion. And that, that's pretty exciting. Um, same thing with full text search, you know, we're 
we're not going to be a, a primary search database, right? Like that's not our core offering. But one of the things that is powerful is being a general purpose database, right? So that we can handle what your workload does. We can handle the different aspects of this. And so um, this is another big sort of uh, feature that allows us to, to say that um, depending upon your workload, we can we can support it, right? We can move these things in place, right? And so I, I think both of those, you know, sometimes they come up in the migration, right? Because you're using these things already and you need to like mm -hmm. make sure the cockroach has them too. Sometimes you realize that, um, you know, your first work workload didn't need it, but your next one does, right? Um, these are these are powerful tools in, in the toolkit to, to help you get into production on Cockroach and, and really move that direction. Yeah, I like thinking of this kind of customer journey. There's the initial kind of you're evaluating in your database, what are the things high level you're looking for? And then you're, okay, well, you've decided this is the thing. Maybe you run an evaluation, maybe there's a test dev type uh, kind of workload, and then you're moving into production. So now what are the things you need for? And it is, they're obviously they're similar and they're related, but they are kind of mm -hmm. different stages in the customer journey and the things that come up in each of those journeys for us as like product folks is, is interesting to hear the kind of customer problems. Yeah, definitely. I think that's yeah. a really well put summary, Lashmi. I think, um, you know, our job doesn't stop when when a customer picks Cockroach. It doesn't stop when the customer attempts to get into production. It doesn't stop when they get into production, right? They right. have to be happy <laughs> and healthy and successful in production, right? Like that's when our, our job is, is done here. And so, I know your team has been really thinking a lot about production, about how to improve that experience, improve operations, all these types of things. What are some of the areas that, that you have invested in on, uh, in this release in that area? Yeah, uh, there's a lot. But in the last couple of minutes that we have left, I think the, the biggest one I want to call out in the kind of getting into production and, and even kind of development and, and testing is uh, our support for Terraform. So Terraform, I'm sure most folks on this call are familiar with, uh, you know, as, a, as an infrastructure as code tool uh, from HashiCorp that really allows you to programmatically um, create resources, cloud resources, access them, delete them, edit them, so on and so forth. So um, most of our enterprise customers, I would say at this point, the majority of them um, are users of Terraform. So they don't want to click the UI to create a cluster, which you can do, it's totally fine. But you know, when you're talking about many teams, tens, 20, 50, 100 clusters, um, yeah, so support for Terraform is generally available. And of course, the cloud APIs that kind of support that. Um, I would say that's probably the biggest one. Um, we also have a slew of kind of security related features. This again comes up um, as you are going into production because you're getting the security compliance folks involved. So things like role-based role, role -based access. Wow, that's a-, a I can never get that one either. Back. I, I <laughs> back. Let's call it our back. Well, don't feel alone <laughs> <Exactly>. on that. <laughs> um, I'm trying to not use acronyms because, you know, yeah, <laughs> but anyway, our back is, is a nice. What kind of PM are you not using an academic? Yeah, I know. Trying <laughs> <laughs> to be not exclusive here. Um, yeah, within the cloud org. So you know, depending on your role, uh, assigning specific sets of permissions, privileges, that kind of stuff, um, and making that kind of holistic story of access, both from the cloud kind of organization perspective as well as the the database all the way, right? And then also linking to the rest of the stack in your. Um, or whether that's SSO, Okta, whatever that might look like. So quite a bit of investment in that kind of security access area. Um, yeah, API Terraform, those are probably the two big ones I want to call out. Um, I think there's other observability things you all have been doing. Depends on time, Ika. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look at you for that. We, we, I think we do have time. Yeah, um, we're good. We okay. Questions right now. Um... So maybe while we, we give people a minute to think about what questions they want to ask us, I'll, I'll plug on observability for a second and then we'll yeah. take whatever questions come from the, from the audience. But uh, yeah, I think observability is, is absolutely key, right? So, um, you know, the best way to get into production and to stay there, right, is to understand what your workload is doing and understand how it works, how it functions, you know, what kind of responses, what kind of performance, you know, throughput, latency, you know, et cetera, right? And so... Um, that's been a big investment area for us over the last year or two is to uh, really take what are now very complex workloads that do, you know, different microservices, different components that operate in different localities, right, um, and make it understandable and helpful and uh, explain what your system is doing, right? So being able to help you understand the, the application through the workload journey of observability, right? So um, we've made some big investments in uh, our tooling with our partnerships with companies like, you know, uh, Datadog and otherwise, right? We've uh, continued to enhance our DB console or Cockroach Cloud console. So this is the native built in observability tooling, right? You don't have to, you don't have to do anything special to get observability built in with Cockroach, right? And so um, we've continued to, to get more fine grained incremental understanding things like um, what indexes are being used and how they're being used, um, understanding, you know, CPU usage and resource and metric usage in relation to your workload, right? Being able to, to understand these types of problems, understand, shine light on not just 
you know, something goes wrong, what's happening, how do I find and fix it, right? But also proactively, like, how could your workload be better? You know, how could we take advantage of insights and, and other things like that to improve your workload proactively, right? Because, you know, for us, it's it's not just about being reactive, right? It's about helping your workload be as healthy as it possibly can be, which is a proactive journey as well. Love it. It's it truly is very intelligent, isn't it? <laughs> that, that, that's, the, that's the goal anyways. Well, we do have one more question um, from the audience. It is about if we could tease any of the upcoming plans on what we're building for the next release. Watch I can go first and go I'll give yeah. Like, uh, one of the things I'm really excited about is where we're going in migration tooling. So uh, we've done uh, quite a bit around the schema and quite a bit around the data movement, um, but we have quite a few ideas about how to. Uh, wrap the entire experience in a, in a live migration service, if you will, how to help you uh, control which database your application is talking to, the source or the target, right? The legacy database or, or cockroach, right? Help you understand how to integrate with these types of things. So I, I think that's something we'll be uh, we'll be hopefully announcing later this year uh, is, is a big step forward in, in migration tooling, even beyond what we've already offered. I'm excited for that yeah. opportunity. <laughs> Uh, yeah, definitely. So the two things, this would should be obvious, we talked about Azure and Multifusion Serverless as both being in limited access and kind of public preview. So getting that to full kind of general availability, that's yeah, it's a huge focus for, for us, right? So specifically on Azure, this means all the capabilities that you are familiar with on AWS and GCP, things like private link, further security features, all of that. So just getting Azure to GA um, and similarly getting multi-region support. Um, in addition to that, I would say there's a bucket of things that we're doing. Um, bucket, is that a good word? Whatever. It's a, it's a group of, of things that we're, we're doing around enabling um, larger and larger enterprises to be on cloud. So it's one thing if you have you know two or three teams with you know x number of clusters per team, uh, but when you go from you know when you're talking about a large financial services company, you're going from like three teams to twenty teams to fifty teams, um, and at that scale, the kind of requirements from these customers change a lot. So they want to be able to have again finer grain permissions, access, uh, billing, uh, being able to uh, segment their clusters and teams in a way that you know again meets their compliance requirements. Um, further, kind of granular uh, control over things like upgrades uh, so they can really plan around their kind of de development life cycle. So there's a number of different capabilities in that bucket, but generally I would, I would classify it as like when an organization standardizes on Cockroach TV as their main database um, and everything that, that we need to do to kind of support that. Um, and that's very exciting for me personally, obviously this means you know usage of the product is increasing within a company. Um, and we're seeing more and more of that uh, kind of expansion. Yeah, that's those are probably my three big ones. That's wonderful. And I am excited to see all of those come to life and specifically come to, come to life at, during our conference, um, RoachFest. So that's my plug, actually. Uh, we will be yes. making announcements of various new features and products um, during that time. It's in October in New York City. So if you're local, if you're willing to travel, this is our user conference. It's the second year we're doing it. We're going bigger. Uh, so check it out on our website. Uh, and while I'm on in plug mode, um, I might as well plug our new next... Um, webinar, which is going to be happening in on June 20th. Um, so this is speaking of migrations, uh, how to modernize from Oracle to Cockroach DB. Uh, so definitely uh, follow us for more webinars. Uh, we also have a podcast and uh, go check out our website to read more about what we talked today about. Um, any other parting thoughts or words from Lakshmi and Andy? I just gotta say, I think you need to follow us just for the cheeky headlines alone. It's not. Yeah, exactly. That. that was pretty good. Yeah, that's really good. Whoever came up with that. Uh, <laughs> the on. only plug I'll say is that uh, it's very easy to get started. Uh, so you know, maybe you were an open source user back in the day where you could like download the binary, which is something you can still do. You can also just sign up for a cloud account for free and get started on serverless, including multi-region for free. So. If you haven't tried it out, this is definitely the time. Uh, and please let us know. We have our community Slack for you know, all kinds of questions, thoughts, um, yeah, and feedback. Yeah, I mean, I, I think you're not even going far enough there, Lakshmi. You can get started in five seconds, right? That's what you said for the serverless cluster. Yeah, right? I, that I've been is through true. that yes. process. Like it's it's sort of magic. You're used to you know having to wait for approval or regular or somebody within your company to give you access to a resource or you know go through the process of provisioning, right? And like you know, bam, you get it right away, right? And I, I think that's really powerful, particularly because it comes with that free tier, right? So you don't have to worry about you know overspending or anything else as you're getting your hands on it and learning how it works and having that experience. So I, I think that 
that, that's definitely the call to action I hope to see everybody do is to, is to give our product a, a good uh, test kick to the tires. I think that's a great way to wrap up the webinar. So thank you so much. I don't see any other questions. If you ever do, feel free to reach out to us. There's many ways to um, reach us. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, oh, there's a question about swag. The first 30 uh, people who joined will be getting the swag, which is the summer bucket hats. And on that, uh, happy summer. Thank you for following us. Uh, we hope to see you at the next webinar. Thanks, Thanks everyone. All. Bye. Bye everybody.